Welcome to getting started with finite element analysis in Fusion 360. There are main steps that are performed while completing an FEA analysis. First we start by setting up the analysis, then we do discretization, better known as meshing, then solve our study. Finally, we will analyze the results as we post-process the results created from the FEA study. But um, depending on which stage of the process, you might be reiterating on this over and over. Um, one, you'll find out in finite element analysis that it's not a one once and done type of thing. What you'll end up doing is um, pretty much redoing it over and over and make sure you converge on a certain stress value or safety factor, depending on what you're trying to analyze. We're going to get to a lot of that throughout this presentation. But let's go ahead and first start off with a little bit of theory. So I always like to start finite element analysis back to theory. So there is this thing called a stress strain diagram. So this is basically, they have different stress strain diagrams for different materials. Um, what we have here is the linear elastic region. Right now in Fusion 360, we only have a linear elastic stress solver. So what it means is basically we can te test in this region where, it's gonna hit, where we're going to test our material. So we need a linear slope. So this is called Young's modulus, it's this slope. So what we need to make sure is we're not testing past it or we're not doing a um, study on something that doesn't have a linear uh, Young's modulus. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But before we do, I just wanted to explain this diagram a little bit further. So stress is force over area. So basically what it's saying is um, if force gets bigger, stress is going to get up. Also, if area gets smaller, stress is also going to go up. So imagine this pipe here. So if I increase force, I'm probably going to see more stress in here, and that's more likely that I'm going to uh, have failure due to yielding. And failure due to yielding happens at this point. So what that means is, let's pretend I'm pulling a bar, op bar apart. Um, when I let go, what happens is if I'm in this region up here, it's going to go back down to the start point when I, if I let go of that force. So this is called our elastic region. So when you apply a stress that's in this region, it's, uh, we're assuming that it's going to come back to this region. Um, if we get into something like fatigue, that's what we're going to talk about soon when we release the fatigue module. Um, we could have failure due to cyclic loading um, earlier than that. But right now, we're just uh, assuming that we're going to um, apply it once. And hopefully, we're going to go for a factor of safety that is a little bit lower. And I'm going to talk about factor of safety a little bit later. But what happens is if I go into this regime over here, this is called our plastic regime. So what happens is if I, let's say, apply stress that gets us up into here, it will not return to the same exact size or length that it was in um, previously. So there's actually some cool things that you could do called strain hardening. You could actually make it more tough by getting it into this region, but we can't analyze that in our current finite elements, element analysis. And then we have our necking region. Um, what I like to think about is uh, um, if you're pulling like a, uh, um, oh man, that candy, I forgot what it's called just off the top of my head. Um, if you pull that, uh, it's the stretchy candy. If you pull that stretching candy, you'll actually see a necking region right in the middle here, and that's called necking. And then it'll keep pulling and necking until it fractures. Laffy Taffy, thank you everyone. That's the one I was going for, Laffy Taffy. So you'll get the necking portion right in there. And then on the bottom here, on the x-axis, we have strain. So that's the change in length over the original length. So if I pull this a little bit, um, it will that that delta L. So the little bit of difference is going to be over L, the original length. And here is some stress strain diagrams for a, a couple different. These are just little pictures of them. So. Um, unfortunately, r rubbers and plastics don't really have a linear region, so we usually we have to go to a nonlinear solver and use different uh, material estima estimations to approximate those curves. Um, but in the current state of that Fusion 360 is in, we can analyze the linear elastic regime for mostly metals. Um, and glass, unfortunately, we can't really analyze as well. So to start off here, um, what we end up doing is the second step after the setup is called discretization or we mesh the model. So what ends up happening is we uh, 
we have an element in this element and we break our part up into thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of these elements depending how complicated we want our um, analysis um, and these elements are called tetrahedrals what we, we refer to them as tets for short basically it's a three-sided pyramid and each one of these is a node so what happens is the um, solver is actually going to calculate displacements and then with, from displacements it's going to calculate stresses for each one of these nodes. So imagine doing that um, hundreds of thousands of times for each one of these nodes. That would basically be impossible for, um, for you to calculate 100,000 times for each one of these nodes. So that's where we're going to lean on our um, computer's resources to solve on it. So oops, go back one. So um, for each one of these nodes, it has a degree of freedom. So normally we have six degrees of freedom, um, three rotation and three translation. So we could translate around the X, along the Y, along the Z. We could rotate along the X, along the Y, and the, along the Z. Unfortunately, or fortunately for us with tetrahedrals, um, we don't have to worry about rotations. We just have to worry about translations at each one of these nodes. So what we're going to be doing is fixing certain faces, edges, and what it's actually doing is taking the degrees of freedom out of those nodes. So you'll see that here in a bit. But for each one of these tetrahedrals, this is for a first order element. Um, we don't have to get buried too into that. I'll talk up briefly about that. But for a first order element, we have four nodes. One, two, three, four for each element I'm talking about. And for each element or for each node, we have three degrees of freedom. So the total number of degree of freedom for one element is 12. We're going to talk about something briefly here a little bit later called a second order element. So what that is, is it puts nodes at the sides here, at the sides of each one. So what we end up getting is 10 nodes for each element, um, which also leads, we still have the same number of deg degrees of freedom for each node, but we also get 30 total degrees of freedom for each element. So you could see as I add more degrees of freedom, what's going to happen really is it's going to slow down my solution time. It's going to be more accurate, but it's going to be slowing down my solution time. It really doesn't help having a solution time of six days if I need to pump out a design, um, an answer to my boss by tomorrow. So we'll keep on going. So ultimately what we're going to end up doing is breaking up our model into hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of these um, tetrahedrals. And we'll see how uh, what goes on there. It's an automatic process, so it's pretty, pretty smooth. So, and I always like to bring this up just to it reiterate, because some people, when they first start finite element analysis, are like, why not just make our mesh as fine as possible? Um, I mean, it's, a, it's definite something you could say, but unfortunately, as the, the finer your mesh goes, the um, Lo the longer your solve time is. So really our job is to try to pump out an answers to our boss or to our team fast as possible. So what we're trying to do is limit um, ha limit the amount of mesh we need, the, the size of our mesh, and get a good solution. So we can, um, at one point, it's we're about going to get the same solution as far we're going to converge on a value. And I'm going to talk about converging a little bit later. So let's go ahead and set up a model. Um, we, these are the things that we need to set up. Materials, constraints, loads, and if you're in an assembly, we need to do contacts. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into Fusion 360. So I have a one-ton jack that um, I've been using here. You could see that it's uh, built up. Um, I like to analyze certain sections of the model depending on the, pro uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. So what we're going to try to solve is um, if this can, uh, this piece right here can survive a load from this uh, one ton force that it would be picking up. So to get in there, we're going to jump into our simulation workspace. So we can come here, hit the model button, go to simulation. And I already have a study there, so we'll examine later so we don't have to watch the solution time. But I'm going to create a new study. And currently, right now, we're, we have um, static stress, which is the linear static stress that I've been talking about this whole time, and modal frequencies. On this presentation, I'm going to be focusing mostly on static stress. Um, so I could cl double click here or hit the OK button. I also can expand out and look at some of the settings here. And I'm going to come back to these settings, but just to note, when you start your study, you can change some of the settings. You can always change them later as well. So I'll go ahead and hit OK. And it's going to create a new study in the tree over here. And you'll notice that I could go back and I already have two studies. You can have as many studies as you would like. 
First off, um, sometimes you design in different units that you um, end up doing simulations on. For some reason, maybe you design in inches and you end up wanting um, your results in megapascals or pascals, who knows. You could come in here, hit edit, and you could change the units for length, mass, times, force, pressure, temperature. Um, we have some custom set, uh, default sets, or you can make up your own. I'll go ahead and leave those as, as is. So what I like to do is right here is basically this first quadrant that I call the setups phase. Um, these five buttons right here. You could either start here and move left, or you could start here and move down. Um, either way is um, it, you'll get used to it. So now you'll sometimes once you get good at it, you'll get so quick that you kind of just jump around and you really don't pay attention to an order. But first off, I'm going to start off with the model. Right now, I'm analyzing my entire design, which this mesh would just take forever to mesh this entire mod um, design, especially the little parts, because the little parts will be meshed at, at the size of the uh, as the rest of the model. But here, I'll go ahead and first just suppress some things. So I'll just grab these guys. Go over. I actually love this little feature. Instead of having to go through here and uncheck these boxes, what you could do is use this little trick. But you see how we have a checkbox and a light bulb. So the checkbox is going to take it out of my simulation study. The light bulb is going to leave it in my simulation study, but it just won't show. Um, in this case, I want to take everything out except what I have selected. So I'm just going to right click on one of these that got highlighted and go to suppress all except selected. And you'll see it just crosses everything off except of what I want to analyze. Let me go ahead and check the questions here real quick. Oh, I lost it on the other screen. Perfect. Um, so now we'll go ahead and analyze these. And you'll notice that it doesn't differentiate over bodies or parts. I can also analyze different bodies if I needed to. Um, it pretty, basically takes every component out there and turns it into a body that we can analyze in simulation. So we'll go ahead and slow that down. Next, we have our study materials. So we could right click and say material override. What it's actually going to do by default is take the materials applied at the modeling level. Um, so when you're in the modeling environment, what you could do is right click and you could go to, oops, had it selected, sorry, right click and go to physical material. And I could click and drag from these co these columns, but for linear statics, we probably want to stick in the metal regime. And you could click and drag, and when you drag it over, what it's going to do is actually take those values in the simulation. But let's say I've applied um, tungsten, and I really want to analyze it in steel. I could actually come in here and go to the material override, and you'll see it's pulling what I have at the modeling level, but I could go ahead and change that if I need to. Perfect. So we'll just keep moving down the list. Next, we'll go to loads. And I'll come in here and say structural load. Um, do watch out because the right click the way I go kind of gives you different options. The options come right here. But maybe I just want, knew I wanted a pressure. You can actually go up here, go to set up structural loads, and it'll give you the same list in that environment. So I just prefer to go to right click structural load and use this drop down here. But I'm going to say I want a force. Um, let's say we want to apply a force here. This is just going to be a demonstration. Um, so let's say I wanted uh, 200 Newton force on this face. So first off, you'll see it's pointing directly down to this face. So what it is actually doing is saying normal to the face. So if I have a cylindrical face selected, what, what it's actually going to do is just put a bunch of force arrows all out in the normal direction. So usually what you'll want to do is go in down a in a direction. direction. Um, so I'll come here and slip, select this one because it's easier to see. Um, you can actually use different directions to change the vector. So what we can use is an angular input. I kind of like to use this if I'm eyeballing things sometimes. I could say maybe I, I don't really know the exact angle, but let's say right around there. Perfect. Um, we can also use vectors, x, y, z coordinates, or you could use a reference angle. So let's say I know that the force is going along this axis, and then you could flip the direction depending on which way you want to go. But one awesome thing that I, I think is very unique, let's change that back to normal, is let's say I wanted to apply a force just to a small portion here. You see what happens is this is actually being applied to this entire face, but I just want to force in this small region. So what we could do is hit the limit target button. And what it will actually give us is this little circle that we could go ahead and use to 
um, really what it's doing is splitting that face and it's just going to apply to the force to this inside region. So once I get a hit OK, you'll see it leaves that circle there and it's actually just going to apply that force to this region. In other tools that I've used, what you had to do was actually go back to, and you, let's say you don't want a circle. Unfortunately, this is what you would have to do if you want anything other than a circle as well. You'd have to go back to the modeling environment, create a sketch on this face, and then once you create the sketch on this face, you would actually use the command called split face. And what that would do is just br break this face into multiple faces so I can apply it to just a small, weird, spliny. Re if I created a spline or a rectangle, I would apply it to that region. So let's go back to the simulation workspace. So in this case, it created a load. Um, let's say I don't want to see this load. I could hit the light bulb. Or if I want to unsuppress it, I could turn it off. Or maybe I'm just like, wow, that was just a stupid idea creating that load. So I could actually right click and say delete. All right. So now we're going to go keep moving on, though. So now let's <clears throat> apply a load for real. And what I want to do is apply a one ton load to these top faces here. So I'm going to come in here and select all four faces. And right now, um, as the current uh, current build stands, um, what it does is applies whatever load to all of the faces combined. So it's not each face gets uh, 100 newtons or whatever I type in there. It's total. Um, but let's say I uh, I know that we're going to apply a one ton to this to this, uh, to this top here. I don't know what that is in newtons. So what I could say is override units. And then I could come in here and pick different um, loads. So I could use dynes, pound forces, so I can maybe calculate. Maybe I know what a ton is in pounds. Or we actually have a ton force. So we'll come in here and say this is a one ton force. And I'll leave it normal to the face. Hit OK. And now you see, see I'm left with all those arrows. Now let's go ahead and add some constraints. So one thing that I find that people do most is they either over um, in simulation is they over constrain their model. So they just add too many fixtures or they use different contacts. We're going to get to contacts in a minute, but first off, we're going to start off with constraints. So what I like to use while I'm applying constraints, and I've actually not seen this in many other tools, it is called the degree of freedom view. So let's go ahead and turn that on. And you see it turns us a bad red color. So right now, um, you'll notice that this stoplight up here is yellow. And um, it started off with red earlier before I applied a load. Ideally, what we're going to do is try to get it to green. So usually, um, you can't solve it at yellow. It will not let you solve it red. Um, you could actually come in here and say a pre-check. If you uh, maybe don't know what you're missing yet, um, it'll actually tell you there are no constraints. So we haven't made any constraints yet, correct. And we have nine fully unconstrained groups. That means they don't know how they react to each other. So we'll, we'll work on that in a minute. And it actually gives you an error message now that I tried to hit that. But now we could go ahead and say use our degree of freedom view. And ideally what we want to get is a green or blue color. And since we're trying to analyze this structure right here, we're going to go ahead and fix this module. So what happens is there's like a piston that gets locked to this, and then these are free to rotate these two about these hinges. So let's go ahead and add some structural loads. So I'm going to say I want to add a constraint, structural constraint. And we have different types of constraints. I'll go through a couple of them in a minute. But we're going to assume since it gets locked in by the piston right here, that, that, that's where we're going to fix it. So we fix it on those two faces and hit OK. And you'll see it turns green for that part. Don't necessarily think that once it turns green, it's OK to go. Because um, right now, it's this is fixed, and this is free to move right now. But I still actually want this to be kind of in that place, but able to rotate. So we call that a pinned constraint. So I could right click, say structural constraint, turn that to our pinned. So what this will allow us to do, it's locking down the radial and axial directions. I can also lock down the tangential direction as well, but I don't need to for this case. So I'll select this face, and while I'm doing that, I'm also going to select these faces as well. And hit OK. And you see that stays green, perfect. But these actually turn yellow. So basically, these are just free to rotate right now. So that we still need to somehow tie these back to this piece that we fixed. 
So that's where assembly contacts come together. So, and you'll notice these are red too. So assembly contacts are probably one of the most confusing things starting for starters of um, finite element analysis. Usually you only use these for contact, uh, assemblies, excuse me. So really what these are, are we're, um, the bad news about FEA, um, I have never seen a software do this correctly, is um, joints or mates or how, whatever you call them from your design tool do not carry over to the finite element analysis, analysis uh, area. So right now these are all just floating in free space. So what I need to do is tell how this component interacts with this component, how this component inter interacts with this component. So that's what assembly contacts are used for. So um, before, I get, before there, I get there though, what we have is this pretty cool um, automatic contact finder, basically is what I call it. Um, here, that's what it's, um, what it's doing is looking for faces essentially that are in this 0.1 millimeter um, tolerance. So it's looking for faces within 0.1 millimeter. Maybe I know my uh, model is going to be a little larger so I could change this value. And then it's going to apply this type of contact. I'll talk about this in a minute. It's going to apply a bonded contact to all of the faces that are found within 0.1 millimeter. So we go ahead and hit OK. Um, what, that doesn't do anything. That's just setting up the like the rule, for instance. But what we can come in here and do, oops, sorry, wrong one, is right-click the construct the constraints and go to automatic contacts. And it's going to run and find all the faces, and it's actually going to apply several contacts for us. And you see, you could have them here. I actually like to use the 80-20 rule. Um, sometimes, sometimes I'll actually just let the automatic contact finder, because sometimes it's really painful to make hundreds of these at a time. And I'll find select the one that I'm looking at, and you'll see it highlights which components it is. Um, and I'll just right click it and edit. So maybe I want 80% of them bonded. So I'll start with the default bonded. And I'll come in here and say edit contact and change this to maybe separation, no sliding, or sliding. Um, so, but in this case, they, I, I want all those to be bonded because we're locking this up essentially when we put this force and the piston reacts on it. But it looks like we had one pin, unfortunately not get in that tolerance. And if you look really closely, you can actually see there's a gap right here and that's over 0.1 millimeter. Kind of made that one happen on purpose so we didn't, uh, so we could show how to make them manually as well. So you could come in here, and uh, so if there's maybe one you don't like, you could turn it off if you don't want it to be bonded, or you could change it to a different contact. And I'll talk about the different contacts right now. So to make a manual contact, you could uh, right-click here and say manual contact, or you could come up here and hit this little icon right here, manual contact. So the manual contact is actually uh, a lot better. This the, the way they did it in Fusion 360 is pretty awesome in my opinion. I'm very impressed. Um, but I'll get to why in a second. So under the type, we have uh, four types: bonded. So that means that the nodes are li they're literally going to lock the nodes together. So they're not able to rotate around each other or translate. Uh, really, they're not able to translate relative to each other. Um, it's going to find uh, nodes that are similar to each face. Then we have separation. So what that means is basically, um, imagine if you had a very high friction item hitting a, uh, another high friction item. It's able to come apart, but once it comes in contact, it locks together. And sliding is basically the opposite. Um, it's not able to come, come apart, or not able to come apart, but it's once it uh, hits, it's allowed to slide against each other. So it's not able to translate away or towards, but it's able to uh, s slide relative to each other. And then we have separation plus sliding, which is a combination of both. It's basically allowing a lot of freedom. You can imagine uh, something with no friction and it's able to move away from each other. So in this case, I want to add bonded though. So in other softwares um, that I've used in the past, when you try to make manual contacts, it's really difficult to come in and like select this face because I want this inside face to this outside face. But what it is, is you first pick which parts or bodies you want to make the contact between. And then you pick the target. Ooh, sorry about that. And then you pick the target. So what you end up doing is you just say, I want this component, this component, it only shows we shows you what you have present, and then it makes the one transparent, which I can't click on, but the one opaque, I could come in here and say that face, and then it makes that one transparent to that to that face. 
So not a lot of like spinning around or using some weird select other tools. Um, you can make these really quickly. Another one I like to like use, um, if you have never used before, I don't find myself using it a lot, but in past tools I used it a ton, is if you hold down the left mouse button for a second, this is called select other. So if um, it pulls up this little dialog that pretty much puts faces, edges, vertices right where my arrow, my cursor was when I was holding it down. And you could highlight through the different faces and get find the face that you want to select. And this tool goes either up or down. So you could select faces, edges, vertices, whether you want to go down the list, or we can go up the list and select the parents tab. And this will select sub-assemblies or top-level assemblies, things that are higher than what I have selected. So we go ahead and rotate our model, and now we're going to go ahead and create a manual contact, and we'll select those two faces, and you'll see it makes the one transparent that I'm selecting, and we can quickly make that contact. Now we're going to make the one more contact to this green component, and you'll see that these blue will turn green because they're all grouped together. So we can switch it to a group view, and this will show you what's been grouped together and what hasn't, so you could see if certain things have contacts between them. Right now we only have two groups, so once we make that last manual contact, it will group them all together and fully fix our assembly. So everything's green, this is good, um, the contacts are set up correctly for our scenario. And the scenario we're trying to analyze is analyzing this bottom of the arm here. And if we were trying to analyze something like this pin, we might want to set this up a little bit differently. Maybe we would analyze fewer components if we were just going to try to figure out if this pin was going to last. But from physical testing, we found that it was breaking on the arm at the lower portion, so we're going to go ahead and set up our FEA analysis to analyze that portion of the study. So now that we're done setting up our analysis, we can go ahead and jump back to our roadmap. And we can see that our first set setup is done, and now we can move on to discretization, which is going to be meshing our model and breaking it up into several pieces for the software to analyze our study. All right. So now we'll keep on going um, into our mesh. So the mesh is where we break our model into hundreds of tetrahedrals. So let's go ahead and look first at a couple different options. So I'll start off by just meshing this. Um, and to do that, we could right click the mesh and say generate mesh. But before we do that, I wanna come back to the settings. So I'll select the settings button and go to mesh. So what it actually do, does is we have, um, it's going to break our model, all the solids, to percent of the size of the model. So by default, it's using 10, and then the minimum element size, size is going to be another percentage of the average size. So we're going to use 20. And then the maximum turn angle is basically the angle of these tetrahedrals for that coming into a point. And then the grading factor, so what's going to happen is we might get some small elements here and big elements here. It's actually going to only be able to, um, for each layer, gain by 50%. So maybe I want it to slow down, um, so small elements here, and then the next layer of elements, I want them to be just as small but a little bit bigger. I might want to go to 1.1, but we'll leave it at 1.5. But... I usually take the defaults here for the first trial, and then I'll come and play with these values depending on how my results are. Try to converge on a value, and I'll still come back to that here in a second. Two that I usually use are these curvature-based um, mesh, are these curvature mesh elements, and the part-based measure for assembly mesh. And I'll show you what those two do here. So what we have are, um, let me. Uh, get this guy out of the way. So the curvature based mesh elements. So if you have curved um, a curved geometry, this is basically I will always come in here and turn it on. Unfortunately, it does slow your solution time down a little bit. But for accuracy, I usually will come in here and turn that on. So you'll see with it off, this is just a uh, basically a cylindrical pipe. It actually what it do what it does is it approximates this by just making like a hexagon essentially or an octahedron it looks like where if I turn it on, you see it actually puts, it makes it a little bit better for the approximation. So what it's actually doing is putting those side nodes I was talking about earlier. So it's putting nodes at the sides here of each element. 
and you see that now it's able to translate there rather than a, just a straight line. It's able to translate at that node. So what we're actually making this is a second order tetrahedral element. It um, is way better for um, uh, if you're solving for stresses as well, because what happens is first order equation is uh, what it's when you're taking the integral of that, you're actually to, this, this is probably going to be in the advanced class, which will come here in a little couple weeks. But um, it's taking that first order equation, and when you take the integral of that, it's that's then um, good for the displacements. A first order equation is good for displacements, finding displacements. But if you're finding stresses or strains, those are second order equations. So you probably want to come in here and turn these curvature based elements on. So the other button I switched on though is use parts base mesh so you'll notice that sometimes you have like a big body like in this um, assembly I'm doing I have a huge body and then I have some little components so what it will do is it's if I have it off is it's kind of going to get a global mesh to everything and what happens to those little bodies is they're not approximated well so the finer the mesh the more accurate it usually is but if I make this fine mesh, just like this one, across the whole entire body, we're just wasting solution time on things that probably don't matter to us as much. So what I like to use is the use part-based mesh. And you'll see what it does is it takes this, just the size of that part and meshes it relative to the rest of the body. You'll see that the nodes, oops, sorry about that, nodes still come up and lock to each other. But... It makes it uh, so I don't have as long as a solution time, but I get good accurate results on smaller components. So let's go back real quick and we'll go ahead and mesh it real quick. We've, we've got a fairly quick mesher. So we'll generate the mesh and I'll show you what a mesh looks like here. And this will take a couple, a little while. Um, of course, if you're going in and meshing a PCB board with thousands of components and uh, little uh, components on the board, this will take quite some time. And the, the, the solve time is usually proportional to the mesh time. If you have a longer mesh, you're most likely going to have a lo longer solve because the longer the mesh is, usually the, that means the more elements you have and the more nodes you have. Um, and the more nodes you ha have is the more nodes it has to calculate when it solves. First, when it's meshing, it's just breaking it up into thousands of these different um, tetrahedrals. We'll be done here just in a second, and there we go. So you'll see that with those buttons on, I get a little finer mesh up here, especially in this area on that pin and on these pins rather than this overall area here. And then that grading factor I was talking about earlier is how quick it could expand from element to element. So you see right here we get kind of tight area of elements, and then this next level it gets a little more coarse, a little more coarse. That's the level of how quick it could go. So a 1.1 there will make it go slower. A 1.9 will make it go faster. So once you get into the mesh, now we have what we have left is to solve. And if you look at the stoplight, I forgot to reiterate that, that back to it, but now it's turning green. So now we could solve. But instead of doing that, um, I want to jump in and show one more thing before we solve. So before we solve, sometimes um, what we have to do is simplify our model. So this is a good example of a PCB board I was talking about. To mesh this and solve this, what it's going to do is have to mesh all these tiny components. Some of these are very detailed. It really depends on what you are trying to analyze in your study, what your end goal. People are always asking, what, how do I simplify? What's the best way to simplify? It's really on a case-to-case -case scenario. There's some tools out there that simplify really well. Um, and here we could use, in Fusion 360, we could use a lot of direct editing or just selecting things and deleting them, depending on what we want to do, or suppressing them. And like, for instance, we could take this complicated PCB board, which is already a simplified version of it, and turn it into something like this. Maybe for if we're trying to do a frequency testing on the PCB board or a thermal study. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and we just talked about the mesh. Now we're going to get into the solve. So some things I would like to talk about, I've been kind of stating these as we've been going through, is the materials linear. This is a linear static problem. There are nonlinear solvers out there. Um, Fusion might be seeing one in the future. Who knows? Um, but there are some nonlinear solvers for nonlinear materials, such as rubbers, plastics. Um, the next one is loads are static. So let's say I apply a force. Um, 
let's go over here. Let's say I apply this force and this is making this bend, or, or this is really a big force and it's making it bend around this whole entire hinge that we created a fixed region. This arrow is always gonna be pointing the same direction. So it will not recalculate the force next to the um, normal to the face as it rotates around it, if that makes sense. Um, but it, if you would like to do that and you have something really deflecting doing large displacements, what we would need to either do is get into a non-geometric linear solver or into a non-linear solver just in general. That will get you a lot more accurate results because what it does is recalculate that force at each step and it, what it will break your problem into multiple steps. So in, here we're only doing one step essentially. So it'll solve basically at each one of these as it rotates around this. But that's really required if you're doing really large displacements. Um, loads are applied slowly and steadily. What I mean by that is we're not punching this thing. We're just slowly applying this load on our design. If we are starting to like punch it, we need to get into a dynamic solver. Um, or if you're like shooting a gun at it, there's some great gun simulations out there that you can go ahead and Google if you want to see that. The next one I kind of alluded back to when I was talking about this one, structural deformations are small. If we are getting to large displacements, very large displacements, um, you pro and that's, uh, uh, you might ask what are large displacements? It's relative to the size of your model. Um, you might want to go to a nonlinear solver as well. And mainly that's because what happens is there is this F equ equation called F equals KX, Hooke's Law. Um, what it's doing in the background is um, K is this ginormous matrix. Um, so it's just got a bunch of numbers in it that it's trying to solve. So with a linear solver, it solves it all initially, that matrix, and it only solves it once. With a nonlinear solver, what it actually is doing is recalculating K at each one of those, um, oops, yes, K is a constant in uh, nonlinear. Sorry, I thought that said X. But uh, K is a constant, and F equals KX means force equals uh, the stiffness matrix times the displacement. So um, at, in a linear solver, what it's actually doing is solving it right up front, and then it's applying that to find displacement, applying the force to, define, to find displacements. With a nonlinear solver, it's constantly recalculating K, and you can uh, calculate X for not like large displacements or nonlinear material. Um, there is a, qu uh, a question for can the solver account for creep? No, not this solver. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and solve. Um, luckily, I already have a study here. So as you can see, you could have multiple studies. Um, what you need to do, you see it turns black. So it's basically saying I'm only editing this study. Um, I could right click this and say activate. And I'll show you a couple cool tricks right now with studies that you can do. So what you can do, actually, I'll come back down here and activate this guy, um, is I'll activate this one. Maybe I want to test this at um, 1,000 tons, and maybe I also want to test it with a different material. So rather than coming in here and changing the material and running it again, um, unfortunately, it would wipe out these results. But maybe I want to compare the results side by side. I can actually right-click, say clone study. It'll make a study three, and you can always right click and go to properties and rename this, oops, not properties, settings, excuse me, and rename the study. Maybe you say different material. So if someone else opens it up, they know why you did it. And then you could go ahead and make a couple changes. Um, but another cool thing you can do is let's say I didn't have the loads here, or I had maybe three or four studies and I wanted to kind of pick pieces of each one to apply from. So I can actually grab the loads from this study, click it, drag it, and drop it on this study. Oops, sorry, got to drop it on the loads. And you'll see it just pretty much copies and pastes. Uh, that one moved it, but if I hold my Command key on Mac or Control key on Windows, it will actually copy it. So that's the secret. Hold Command or Control to copy. If you don't hold those, it moves it. But I'll come back up here and activate it. My original study that I've already solved. And you'll be like, where are the cool, pretty results? Um, if you ever don't see the results and these aren't yellow, what's happened is uh, you have to come in here and turn the results view on. So just turn that on. Maybe you don't want to see results. You could turn normal view on and it turns it back to the model. But I'll turn my results view. So we could see our results. Let's go ahead and talk about some things we could do with the post-processing. So 
Before I get there though, let's actually take a, a little look. So we want to analyze our results. It's always good to, I like to see the mesh overlaid on the, um, the results. That's because I could see if there's a fairly high mesh there, it's probably a little bit more accurate. If I don't see it, let me turn that off. If you come to uh, views, toggle mesh visibility, it turns it off, but it looks a little bit cleaner. So maybe if you had a presentation or something like that, I'd probably want to go with this because maybe they don't understand my boss or um, marketing doesn't understand the mesh. But here, I like to, if I'm analyzing results, I like to toggle the mesh visibility on. And you could do that as well by just clicking the light bulb next to mesh. All righty. So there's some cool things down here. By default, it goes to the safety factor. So the factor of safety is the actual stress over the stress. Uh, or for over the yield strength, excuse me. Um, so what's going to happen is basically if that falls below one, we're failing due to yielding. So um, we're basically going into that plastic regime I was talking about earlier. So we're somehow um, stressing our model to be able to not return to its original place. This is usually bad. Um, and this is why linear static usually solves a lot of problems out there is because usually you want everything to ha be a force applied and apply, c come back to the same state it was. Some problems are really tricky. Like for instance, maybe you want to see how far a paperclip you uh, applying a force to a paperclip and you want it to come back to a different value than you uh, started with. In that case, we'd want to go to a nonlinear solver. The nonlinear solvers can uh, figure out where it's going to displace back to. Here we could just t tell, oh, it's not going back to its original place. So it's failing due to yielding is what we would say. So in this case, we'd probably want to make a design change. I'll show what I would do in a couple seconds, but we can actually see the number of nodes, 106 nodes and how many elements we have as well. So if I increase the mesh, I'll probably get a little bit more accurate results, but I'll also probably kill my solution time a little bit. But we could change what type of plot by going here. Um, let's go to my stresses. So we could see where high stress is, um, and we could change the units we want to see in stress. I changed the default units up here globally, but I can also come by for each study and pick one by one. And I also could pick what type of stress plot. We can look at first principle, third principle, normal XX. And we're probably going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's really, or in the, the advanced class. But that's more for if you're trying to see maybe if you're failing due to compression, due to tension, things like that. Um, then we can also come in down and look at displacements. So maybe this thing has some metal bar we had designing and we didn't want to, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to crash into the metal bar um, due to this force. We can actually see how far it's displacing. Um, and it's looking like uh, 1 point or point, point 0.1469 millimeters. And you could also look at it in the different directions. So in this case, if there was something below it, I'd want to see the displacement in just the Y or maybe just, uh, it'd probably just the Y in this case, but we'll look at the total. And then we also have strain and contact pressure as well, but we'll take a look at those later. So let me go back to the stress plot. And one thing I always like to do, this is always really hard to like look at because you don't maybe necessarily know where the high stresses are, is you come in here and grab the uh, arrow at the bottom and you can actually do what we call ISO clipping. And it will actually just show you where the high stress points are as you drag this up. Or maybe I wanted to lightweight this a little bit. Um, maybe this thing's too heavy, we're sending it to space, who knows. Um, we can actually drag this down. And now we're looking at just the points of really low stress. So maybe I would just want to cut a pocket right in there if I didn't want to. But then you always have to think of manufacturing costs. It's always a, a, a game you have to play. Um, it really comes down to what is the priority in your design in your design intent. So we could come through there. Also, what we can do is we could change the plot limits. If I double click, I always forget where to double click. There it is. And I could come in here and maybe say that out of 100. And you see it changes the plot a little bit and puts it to 100. And we can also just uh, change a couple other things here. I rarely ever come in here, but you could change this, this um, legend size, this large, um, the color transition. Watch as you see the color transition, it kind of fades green to blue. May, you could go to banded and it sh does uh, different color regions. So it's here to here is blue, here to here is light blue, and it's uh, what we call it banded or discrete. So we'll go back to smooth. And then uh, I'm, these don't do too much, unfortunately, um, in this case. But maybe in the next one, I'll show you a good one. 
So we have our plot here. Um, also, you might notice, let's go to a front view. This was our original design, and this is where it is now. Honestly, that's not how far it's displacing. Unfortunately, or it's unfortunate, fortunate, um, it's actually um, exaggerating these by default. Um, it, it helps you see which ways forces are going and make sure that everything's going in the right direction. But you could go in here and go to results, options, deformation scale, and you could say undeformed, actual. You'll see once I turn it to actual, it is almost about it because you remember when we went to displacement, um, it was displacing 0.149 millimeters. So that's about 0.149 millimeters, very tiny. Um, and then you could also say, I want to adjust it by five. Really, oh, maybe I'm just making this for a marketing presentation. Really exaggerate that displacement. So let's go back to, I personally like the half, about the half range right there. So that's just some good th good tools to analyze your model. Um, I'm going to keep talking here a little bit. Um, we can also turn our min-max query. I forgot to show that. Um, and that's actually going to show where the min and max displacement are in this case. If I go to stress, it'll show me the min and max stress. So the max displacement is happening up top right here at that point for in that node. And then finally, I think the coolest thing that everyone wants to see is the animation. So we could come in here. Let's go to the stress plot and look at that. Oops, that's stress just animation. So we could come in here, say animate, hit play, and you'll actually see this. Uh, it's going to step through. It's actually just interpolating between the high stress and the low stress, and it's just going to play back and forth. And you could speed that up. Maybe it's not fast enough for you. Or you can add more steps. And what it's just going to do is interpolate between the last point, and let's say I put 30, different, 30, 30 steps between the um, no stress and the fully loaded case. And I also could record this and save this out as an uh, animation. So we'll go ahead and cancel that. Super good to analyze. Oh, and I forgot to show you can also, um, I always like to rotate around and as I as it's solving so you could kind of see in certain areas why is it stopping there we go where it's being high stress down here so let's go ahead and jump back so perfect so we got a couple more man minutes um, uh, so we're going to talk one more thing about our last thing is our meshing so our mesher uh, has been, we've meshed it once. And what I told you is you want to go and make sure you converge on a value. So we have this tool called adaptive meshing, and it's an H adaptive mesher. So what it does is it looks at places of high stress and it applies a higher mesh in that area for, area for us automatically. It's actually looking at this thing called total strain area, but what we where to, high total strain area is, is it's a high stress. So you'll see oops, in this case, what it did is start off with basic mesh, and then it got, this is what the, the results look like. And then it, we uh, let the H adaptive go. And you see now here, it, this is an exploded view. Look at the mesh in this area now. It's super tiny. Um, what it's actually doing is we want to make sure it's running each study, remeshing, running each study, remeshing, running the study, remeshing over and over and over again. So what we're making sure is this is the first study. We ran it. Um, then it found a stress value here. Um, then we rerun it. And then this is what we would want to do manually. But with H Adaptive, it does it automatically for us. It usually takes a lot longer because it has to run study five um, an X amount of times. I'll show you how to specify that. But we want to make sure that convert converges on a value. So where it's bad, though, is where it's diverging. If you run it and it doesn't satisfy the target percentage and you see it jumping around or it's constantly going up, that is called diverging because we're not getting in on a value. And things can diverge when there's stress singularities. And stress singularities, you just have to remember that they happen on sharp re-entry corners. So you see how this is a sharp corner? So an FEA, we, that produces a stress singularity. And we're going to go further through this in the advanced class. But what it's going, um, going to do is have really high stress here. And it's actually the finer the mesh we get there, the higher the stress gets. So you constantly just see the stress go up and up forever as I make it the stress of the mesh finer in that area. But we want to make sure it converges on a value. The cool thing is we could turn on the adaptive mesh by coming back to the settings where I've been changing the mesh earlier and check these two boxes. There's the adaptive mesh checkbox. 
So we could do, just turn it on by checking this box, turn up to high, or maybe I want to medium. And this is what it's going to use. So this is the number of steps, basically the number of studies it's going to run. Then this is the target that it's going to try to satisfy. You can change these R manually, but you'll see as I drag this around, it actually has some default values in there. So what we have now is when I do run that, you'll see that down here I have a little higher uh, element count than up here. That's because I ran this one with an adaptive mesh. And if we come up here to the convergence plot, you'll actually see this converged in two steps. It hit that 5% target criteria, and we can actually see the convergence plot here. This is just another great aspect to make sure your, your results come accurate or are accurate for certain regions. So we could go ahead and close this if we need to, but we'll get further into that into the into the next um, webinar. Finally, we, what's good for all these results if we can't publish this out to our public? So we could come down to here to results, report, and I could, uh, yep, I want that guy. So this is the study. I have three studies, so I could publish all of them in one report if I needed to. And then I could pick which, what, which plots I wanted to show. So it has some defaults here. You could also reset them or select everything and have everything. But I'm going to go ahead and preview this. And once the preview is generated, we can go ahead and examine our results right in a web browser. So we could see how the setup was done, what, uh, loads we placed on certain faces and then we can go ahead and examine the results as well right here on this report and it automatically all, all pushes this to a report for us so now let's go ahead and jump in and another great thing about using fusion 360 is we can view these simulation results right in a web browser maybe we have a team member that's traveling or a boss that ne doesn't necessarily use cat anymore and he just needs to inspect it he can actually just be invited to a project and he can view these simulation results right in a web browser. So let's go ahead and open that up real quickly. And you could see he could spin, interrogate the design, see the results right here in the web browser. And then he could comment and give feedback whether maybe we need to approve a design change or we need to maybe scratch this design and work on something else. We can also share a link if we wish to send this to an external customer. But that's like sharing a link in Dropbox. And also we can examine different versions. So maybe if we had different simulations based off of different thicknesses for versions that we've been changing, we can go ahead and jump back to that version and inspect maybe different result plots. So now let's go ahead and examine one more design. Sorry, jumped back real quick. And we can actually see in this design, it the simulation results travel with it. So we could go ahead and interrogate it once more, and you'll see that it shows us the what's the setup and everything. So great, you could go ahead and use a browser. Now we have a, a new update coming in November. Um, we're going to be adding point mass, so don't have to mesh everything in your model. You can use that um, body or put a, a mass somewhere else outside of it and still have that act like it's still the still there on your design, but it won't mesh it. Also, we have added a gravity load, so you can either use uh, the gravity of Earth or you can change gravity to maybe if you want to inspect something on Mars or something. And we've also added volumetric mesh. So the plots will show the volume of it as well. So you'll see the stress plot right there has the volumetric mesh there. As, as well, this is going to be um, preparing for thermal studies that are going to be coming in the future. And finally, there's a new webinar coming up on December 17th for an advanced FEA. One of my colleagues will be performing um, some extra high-end things that are done in FEA to simplify, to set up, to mesh for contacts. Highly recommend it. Thank you for watching this webinar, and view our YouTube for other quick tips.